the table of nations. I want to read a few things to you guys out of the New Testament that I think are good for us to get a base here. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, as Jesus begins his earthly ministry, it says, For that time, or from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the first recorded message we have there of uh, of Christ is the is the message of repentance, a call to repentance. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're going to be getting into the establishment this morning of nations and kingdoms and uh, and uh, Babel and Babylon, and we'll get into some of those things this morning. But we also we have this opportunity through Christ to be part of a much greater kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of Christ. Repent. Because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so as we're reading these things, there's an invitation into this superior kingdom. Those who, place their, who repent from their sins, place their faith in Christ, will dwell with him in his kingdom forever. Jesus uh, said to Pilate over in John... Let me turn over there, John 18. Pilate therefore said to Jesus, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. Right above that, uh, Jesus answered, uh, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. So that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate opens in verse 33. I see it, but are, you, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replies, my kingdom is not of this world. He is a king, but his kingdom is not from here. Over in Hebrews chapter 11. Starting in verse 13, as he gives these different men of faith, examples that he gives us prior to this verse, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And we, of course, read about that in Revelation. As we get into the establishment of these different nations and, and the things we will learn from Babel, I want to remind all of, all of us who have placed your faith in Christ, we are part of a better kingdom. We have a citizenship that is not of this world. This is not our homeland. And though we can identify and we have a physical side and we all go back with bloodlines to Adam and to Noah, we have been brought in to the family and the kingdom of God. And we will dwell in that kingdom forever. And that is where our hope is. Our hope is not in the kingdoms of men. Our hope is in a godly kingdom. Thank you, Lord, when you get to live under a good kings. Thank you, Lord, when you get to live in a good country. I'm thankful for our country. Heartbroken about so many of the ways it's going. But our hope is not here. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And we will dwell in his kingdom under his perfect reign. Amen? The 10th chapter of Genesis, we have some parallels that we'll hit again from Revelation. We have this scattering of the people over the earth. Uh, We have in Revelation the gathering of the people or the harvest of the end times. In Genesis 10, we have a kingdom that is evil, the first kingdom presented. In Revelation, we have an eternal kingdom, kingdom established with Christ himself as the eternal king. 
In Genesis 10, we have a rebellious one. And in Revelation, the rebellion is destroyed. In Genesis 10, we have the uh, birth of false religion. And in Revelation, false religion is destroyed. In Genesis 10, we have the lineage of the Messiah. And in Revelation, we have the eternal reign of that Messiah. Thank you, Lord. That is awesome. This chapter here, uh, uh, chapter 10, is a very unique chapter in human literature. We have different stories that go back through different nations, different um, uh, accounts from old civilizations of like a global flood. We have different accounts of things similar to the Tower of Babel, but told differently that have been handed down. Chapter 10, where we have a lineage that ties from the global flood to maybe what we might call more of the known history to the time of Abraham, this is the only uh, genealogical record that we have. One uh, archaeologist that's very well known, William Albright, put it this way, the 10th chapter of Genesis stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel even among the Greeks where we find the closest approach to distribution of peoples in genealogical framework. The table of nations remains an astonishing, accurate document. So we have here, of course, in this chapter is the beginning of the establishment of nations and people groups. All come from Adam and all come from Noah and his three sons. Mankind being equal in value, but not always equal in influence, power, or position throughout different times in history. We also see uh, that these things will hold relevance for our understanding of things in the last days. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. Again, as we mentioned earlier, we see the first kingdom mentioned here in the Bible, the first use of that word. And we also can learn some things. All people came from Noah. What is something that we can grab from that that's important for us in our time? There is no ethnic superiority of one group over another. We all go back to a common ancestry. We're all just the human kind. That's it. And so there is no superiority of one race or ethnicity over another. I don't even like the word race. is because we are only one race. So let's begin in verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Medea, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Repheth, and Togamah. The sons of Javan were Elijah, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dodanim. For these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. I'm going to hint or hit briefly on where these groups generally landed. There's going to be some distributions that they were mixed, I'm sure, with times, but essentially the sons of Japheth, probably covering the largest territory, is going to be Europe, Russia, uh, northwest kind of of India, and even eventually uh, India and parts of Asia. So this covers a big area of where the descendants of Japheth went. Japheth is the youngest of the three brothers, probably going uh, from the youngest to the oldest because uh, of it ending with Shem, who is who the Jewish people came from. And so since they picks up right in chapter uh, 11 and 12, really getting more into the history of the Jewish nation, it makes sense to leave him there. Others think that perhaps it is written in this way because Shem recorded it and he put himself last as he recorded it. But it would seem that it's fitting. Uh, But we're going essentially from brothers here, then from genealogical record, we're going from the youngest to the oldest. Verse 5, it says, From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. We'll see that there's four things predominantly, and this is repeated with each of the three sons as their their, uh, genealogical record is given, separated by lands, languages, families, and nations. This also lets us know that this was written at the same time 
or with chapter 11 because uh, in chapter 11, it opens within, uh, in this time, the language was divided as it gets into the Tower of Babel. So as we read chapter 10, it's a lot like when we are reading Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 goes over and gives more detail. Well, Genesis 10 has given us a record of the different people, and Genesis 11 is going back in and giving us more detail. Uh, is it cold in here this morning? We need to turn. Can you turn the thermostat up a little bit? I don't usually fill it up here, and I'm like, man, it is cold. It's probably freezing out there. Sorry about that. We'll get taken care of. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so again, this is uh, best to look at chapter 10 and 11 as written, uh, or of course, written as one group. The chapter divisions, if you're not familiar, are added later, so it's easy for us to reference. When the book of Genesis was written, there was no chapter references, there was no verse references. And so when we say that 10 and 11 go together, the original author didn't separate them with a chapter marker there. And, and so it's very fitting for us to look and go, yes, these clearly flow together. And as we get through them this morning, I think you'll clearly see that. Verse 6, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta. Ramah and Sabteca, and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From, the, from that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kalah, and resin between Nineveh and Kalah. That is the principal city. All right, these are the, the descendants of Ham are predominantly Africa and small parts of the Middle East. That's kind of where his descendants predominantly went. And we get a pause here in the genealogy and insights into one person, Nimrod, who began to be a mighty one on the earth. He is not the first mighty man to be on the earth, but perhaps he was one of the first men that's recorded to acquire great power. And he used his power to draw men away from God and to himself. We'll see that a little bit, of course, into chapter 11 uh, with the formation of Babel. And we also see it through the rest of Scripture that Babylon is always in a negative light. Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his commentary says this, in rabbinic tradition, the phrase a mighty hunter means he snared men with his words and incited them to rebel against God. The Jerusalem Targum also translates this verse this way about Nimrod. He was, a power, he was powerful in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord, for he was a hunter of the sons of men. As he said to them, depart from the judgment of the Lord and hear the judgment of Nimrod. Therefore it is said, as Nimrod, the strong one, strong in hunting and wickedness before the Lord. A hunter it refers to one who is tracking down, capturing, and killing game for food. That, that's kind of the definition there. But uh, people who can read the original language, several different commentaries they'll talk about is there's a clear thing with it with plays in here. It's not just talking about that he was just a hunter of animals. Uh, that could have been a part of it. He might have hunted some impressive animals or something in his time, but it's really more talking that he is becoming a powerful person, and he, in his power, he is pushing people away from God. He is drawing people away from God. That's really what it is more what he's referring to. Barnhouse, in his commentary, he renders the paragraph this way. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a a mighty despot, powerful ruler, in other words, in the land. He was an arrogant tyrant, defiant before the face of the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty despot, haughty before the face of the Lord, and the homeland of his empire was Babel. That is how he uh, basically translates that same verse. And so we can see that within the Hebrew, there's some wordplay that's not coming through for us necessarily with just the terms mighty hunter. 
We'll get that more again as we read about Babel and see what he was doing. In chapter 11, he is not mentioned as, uh, with Babel, but verse 10, of course, gives us the insight that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so we know he is the builder behind Babel and the Tower of Babel. And we'll get into those things a little bit more. This is the first mention also of a kingdom. First mention of a kingdom here is of Nimrod. First mention in the Bible. We didn't see one of those mentioned prior to the flood. We had cities mentioned, but this is the first kingdom. Babel and Babylon are understood to be the same place, Babel just being the earlier name. Babylon, of course, is the greatest of the kingdoms of men, and it is uh, an evil city as, as far as the way it's overall recorded in the Bible. It is currently of no significance, but it will again one day uh, become significant and it will be destroyed in Revelation 18. It is contrasted with Jerusalem. So the Bible tells the, these, these stories within the story, right? Within the uh, accounts of the historical thing, God paints these pictures. And you have a, a, a tale of two cities. You have Babylon, the city of men, uh, this evil city. It, it is the uh, birthplace, as we'll see, we'll get into this, of, of all the false religions and, and things of that nature in the world. And it is destroyed, ultimately, in Revelation 18. And you have Jerusalem, the city of the king, the city that will endure forever, the city that will come down out of heaven uh, and is the place where Christ will reign from forever. Now, that doesn't mean we can't ever look back in history and see something good that happened in Babylon or where somebody did something good in Babylon or that we can, can't look back in history and see evil kings reigning in Jerusalem. But we have from the beginning, when Jerusalem's first mentioned uh, in Genesis 14, it's under the name Salem, Jeru Salem, Jerusalem, as the early name for it. And the king, of course, is Melchizedek, king of righteousness, with no end. Right? We read about him more in the book of Hebrews. And we have that, and then we have the eternal reign. So you see these pictures God's creating. And Babylon is, uh, is of course, the, the city then again of of evil, essentially, of rebellion against God. And Jerusalem is the city of the king of kings. And so we have some of those things that are, that are good for us to have an understanding for as we go through this chapter. He leaves this place, the, uh, the city of Babel, of course, we read here too, from the land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh. Why did he leave? It's probably most likely that he left, and we'll get into that in chapter 11, that when God spoke the lang uh, changed up the languages, that he no longer spoke the right dialect to be there, or the right language to be able to stay in the city that he was building. He was removed from it. That's probably the most likely reason that he went to, uh, to Nineveh to build these other cities. Let's pick it up in verse 13. Mizraim begot Ludim, Anaim, Lehebim, Naphtuhim, Pathruzim, and Kashluhim, from whom came the Philistines and Kaphtorim. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, the Arvidite, the Zemurite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed, and the border of the Canaanites was from, uh, was from Sidon as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. Then as you go toward uh, Sodom, uh, Sodom, Gomor Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, and their lands, and in their nations." Whew, man, those names are a tongue twister. <laughs> Glad we don't use those names, right? When you name people, it's like at least people only pull names out of the Bible, like Jonathan or David or things, you know, like these, these names. <laughs> uh, again, though, we see here as he closes about the uh, lineage here of Ham, we see this same division, uh, the division of people by lands, languages, families, and nations. So God is scattering out the people out. They're establishing these different people groups. 
And eventually these, of course, are greatly influenced by the languages that God breaks up in chapter 11. Verse 21. And the children were born also to Shem. This is mostly the Middle East area and, uh, and the Jews. We'll get into that. The father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. The sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphax, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hol, Gether, and Mash. Arphax begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For his days on the earth was the, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almadad, Sheleph, Hazar Mavith, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, and Diklam. Obal, Abimela, Abimel, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling places. Dwelling place was from Mesha as you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. You know, sometimes we read through those things, and in our devotion time, if you read through those things, sometimes you're just happy when you get through all the names, and you're going, man, why are they all in there? There's actually several significant reasons for these uh, passages. Again, like I said, this is the only part of history that we actually understand that we can trace all the different people groups back to, and the majority of people groups, we can still trace back to these different names. It's phenomenal. Um, And so thank you, Lord, for those things. It is, of course, also, more importantly, recording for us here within it is the lineage of the Messiah. Right there, we have the birth of a lot of the different nations and things we see uh, coming from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But most importantly, and what we're going to see the author continues to hone in on, is the line of the Messiah. It says here, to Eber was born two sons, Eber is an early name for the word that gave rise to the word Hebrew. And so that's where the essentially where the name Hebrew comes from. And so this is that he he was the father of the Hebrews. And Eber were born to two Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. All right, the earth was divided. What does that mean? Some people think that this is referring to when the continents were split up, when the continents kind of got uh, to what we see today with South America, North America, and different things. Uh, I don't see it that way. I think I used to, from a quick read, kind of think that's what it was saying. I don't think that makes the most sense. I think the continents were divided during the flood, when the fountains of the deep were open, when the volcanic activity was going on, uh, and the waters dried out. I think we ended up with the different continents. I think that's probably the, the most reasonable explanation of how those came to, their, to the way that we see them today. I think this makes much more sense that it means that during his time, uh, the people were divided by the language. During his time was the time of the Tower of Babel, when God separated people uh, into different language groups. For in his day, the earth was divided. The people on the earth were divided. And I think that is what he is referencing here. Uh, I believe... Um, that he is the fifth generation from Noah, and uh, Nimrod is a fourth generation. So they should be very close in time that they are on the earth. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. So again, we have the dividing of the people into these four groups, lands, language, family, and nations. Excuse me. Verse 32. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So this is the beginning of people groups, how nations were formed. How did people end up with different languages and stuff? We'll get into that here, of course, in chapter 11. But this was the birthplace of all those different things. This is the history of those things. 
all the people on earth find their roots in this chapter. That's phenomenal when you think about that. It's a neat piece of history. From Adam to Noah, and from Noah, we can now trace from here, from these three sons to current day. All people groups, this is also a reminder, all people groups then came from Adam originally, meaning that all different people groups around the world are made in the image of God. And there is no different races. There is just humankind. There's just mankind. There is no other kind. And so it's important that we also remember that. You know, the world is constantly trying to divide us over these different things. But in Christ, there's supposed to be uh, unity as we are now citizens of his kingdom. And his kingdom should be unified in him. Amen? Let's go into chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Okay, again, this re- overlaps with the early part of chapter 10. Uh, Nimrod only being the fourth uh, generation from Noah. And it says the whole earth had one language and one speech. So I read that time, so there was just one. The city of Babel, uh, again, according to verse 9, was built by Nimrod, who was the descendant of Ham. and went from uh, Ham to Cush to Nimrod. Language is something also that we can greatly take for granted, language reminds us that we were created because it's an incredible thing that we can communicate with one another through different sounds and syllables that we are able to write languages all around the world is an incredible thing that screams at us that we were made. It didn't just evolve by chance. The ability to communicate and understand, not only can we do those things, we have ears to hear it, we have tongues to make the sounds, uh, and then we have the understanding to, to, um, to understand languages. It's an incredible gift. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. This is the region that it's mentioned here that fits the description of ancient Babylon, the location. It is also one region traditionally suggested as the location of the Garden of Eden. So some people think that is perhaps why they were going back to this area. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. According to Henry Morris, archaeology has revealed that this type of kiln-fired brick and asphalt construction was common in ancient Babylon, just as it tells us that's where they started with. And when they dig it up, that's... Uh, something common that they find in that area. And it's important also that we recognize with some of these things, they weren't, you know, cavemen. (laughs) They had the ability to build. If you actually read a lot of different things about history, a lot of the different technologies and the things they built, we're not sure how they did it. Uh, But they obviously understood things. You know, they could move 50-ton rocks. They could carve them. Uh, They could build tall structures. Much, much more impressive than uh, I think we think or that maybe they're depicted in ancient times in, in movies or different things. And so these are, these are still smart people. And we see, though, within the type here that's listed, when archaeologists go and dig in that area, that is what they find. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Four things they wanted to accomplish, building a city for themselves, a tower whose top is in the heavens, a name for themselves, and that they wouldn't be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This account, I think often, when we read it still in the English, is almost confusing. Why did this bother God? Why did God step in and change things? And and there's this 
uh, things that I think hopefully we'll see, I'm hoping we can draw them out, that is that these things are being done in a defiance of God. And they are establishing, essentially they're trying to establish a kingdom of, of men apart from God. And that's what very clearly I believe what he is teaching here, what is, what is going on. And so they wanted to build this city and they uh, wanted to have a different God in it. And I believe that's what the tower is very clearly referencing. Building a city was not a problem. They were built before uh, the flood. People were not judged for building a city then. Uh, Jerusalem, the heavenly city, where Christ will reign. So the fact that they're just building a city is not the problem. It's the purpose behind their uh, building efforts. Again, Babylon is the first named kingdom, not the first city. They did have those, again, pre-flood, but it is the first named kingdom. It is perhaps the first, first uh, system we see of a, of a type of a king and also having a religious system tied to it. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. But if there was not the confusion of the languages, it sounds like this would have become the first world empire. That's essentially the way it's described. If God did not come down and scatter it, this world would have dominated, this city would have dominated the world. What's wrong with that? Well, if they dominate those things and they're pushing a certain religion, it could definitely make it difficult for people who want to follow the truth, couldn't it? And, uh, and so we see here that God intervenes. The second thing is they wanted a tower whose top was in the heavens. Uh, some people do look at this as just a general tower. I don't see it that way. I don't see it that it's a general tower at all. Uh, for one, they're building this tower that they want to reach the heavens in a valley. And so that doesn't make any sense to me. If they're actually talking about that they're just trying to build it really tall where it's going to be up in the sky, um, why wouldn't they not just go to a mountaintop? Why would they build in a valley? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, what would be the problem? We build large buildings today. What would be the problem? And so I don't see that this is just a physical tower that's just something to look at. It would seem much more fitting that this is some form of a structure for a false religion. And within what we see described throughout the word through uh, about Babylon, I think that's much more fitting. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, it says, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Harlots and abominations mentioned here are the false religions of the world. And Babylon is the mother. It's where they all come from. Uh, all cults, all false religions, all idol worship finds its roots in Babylon. Where? Back here at this tower. This tower is also commonly thought to have something to do with astrology, something to do with the different things of a form of worship of the stars, of, uh, or of demonic worship. We don't know exactly what was going on. Why didn't he record it for us? Probably because if he did, people would take it and practice it. That's probably why he didn't record it for us. Um, but there was, it was obviously something that was very, uh, very... I'm looking for the right word. Nimrod was clearly making a statement of defiance against God in what he was doing. And so this, this tower is very offensive against God. I also don't believe at all that Nimrod was unaware of God. This was not something that was just done in ignorance. He's only the fourth generation from Noah. And if, if you follow the uh, timeline that's going to be given here in chapter 11 it's a high chance that Noah was even still alive. And so I don't think at all that he was unaware of the true God. I think this was very much an intentional act of rebellion. He chose to follow Satan instead. He didn't want to follow God. So this is a, the first then recorded city with a temple or a place constructed for worship of false deities a demonic place of worship in defiance of the one true God. 
Third, it said they, uh, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be remembered. Several people actually think the story of Marduk of the Babylonians, the uh, god of the Babylon, is a spiritualized story of Nimrod that's possible. There's several different stories that would go back and be fitting for Nimrod or different legends. Uh, but either way, they're working and they want their names to be remembered. And then the amazing thing about sin is how it kills the thing that you're after. See, sin always brings death. That's what it tells us. The wages of sin is death. And we know that has a spiritual death, but it's the same we see with everything. If you lie, you kill your word. Right? We see this within, within, if you go after pornography, you will kill intimacy in your marriage. If you go after, whatever it is that you're going to find satisfaction in, that is the area when you seek it in sin that you bring death to. And we see that with these guys because here they are wanting to make a name for themselves, but who is remembered forever? Those who are written in the book of life. Here they are seeking to make a name, but they're doing it in defiance of the only one who can establish them for eternity. And, and you see, there you go. we see right here from the very beginning of things too with, with the establishment of the nations, sin brings death. They sought out to make a name for themselves, but they will perish and not be remembered forever. Verse four, uh, four, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God said to his son, uh, or God said to Noah and his sons, right, to fill the earth. They were to scatter out around it. It seems also, though, that Nimrod wanted the people to be central around Babylon, not scattered, and that, of course, would make it easier for maintaining a system of worship. Uh, I would seem to me, I, don't, I didn't read different commentators, but being a fourth generation, you know, at this point in time, there's probably hundreds to maybe thousands of people in there. There's not a huge population yet. And so centralizing all the people and creating a different form of worship uh, and making that a part of the system would be, of course, a, a powerful deception. So verse five, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord, there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the third judgment that we really see in the book of Genesis. We had the expulsion from the garden, we have the global flood, and now we have the confusion of the languages. I was thinking about that, like next time, you know... Uh, I flew in and out of Vegas Airport sometimes when we were moving out here, and uh, and I think that uh, one of the things I was reading I think that over like a hundred languages are spoken in Ve in Vegas on a daily basis. It's like one of the, the one of the most cities with the most languages spoken on a daily basis in the world. And why do we have all these different languages? Because when man could communicate, they used it for sinful purposes. <laughs> To, to unite in sinful causes against God. It's interesting, as language becomes less of a barrier, that the world becomes more wicked, isn't it? And we see this. The building was not stopped because it was a city or tall, but because it was beginning, uh, the beginning of a false religious system. And this scattering of people into groups made it impossible for a one-world system. I find it fascinating uh, because we see such parallels here. The Antichrist will rule and, uh, from Babylon. He'll, he'll, uh, Babylon is destroyed. It's one of his cities that's mentioned there is destroyed uh, in Revelation 18 and, and elsewhere in other passages. But it'll also have a religious and political power to it, just like Nimrod had. I found that very fascinating. He will set up a one world government. He'll do away with all the religious systems of the world and centralize it into one false religion. So when we get to the, to the end times, right, we have the, the marrying of all these false religions essentially at the beginning 
uh, the beginning of the tribulation, we have all these, uh, mo- you know, everybody except for a few people who, who repent and place their fi- faith in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for those people and that they come to know him, even if it's after we're gone. Uh, but we see that all these systems, all these false religions, they get pushed into essentially one system. But after several years, about three and a half years, about halfway through, that system is destroyed, and now it's just this direct worship of the beast. There's now one system, and it's tied back to the Antichrist. And it's uh, fascinating that Nimrod is such a picture of the Antichrist. He's from the tower, he's from the city of Babel. He's creating this religion that's in defiance of God, and he's grabbing men into this system. So much so that God stops and says, Not now. (laughs) <laughs> not yet. That system's not happening yet. But who's behind Nimrod? Satan. And who's behind the Antichrist? Satan. It's amazing how long he's working towards the same end, towards the same means. And so I believe we see within Nimrod this first picture of the Antichrist. And as we look at the systems in our time, right, we see the, the worldly systems, and we, and we can get worried sometimes about what things are going on, uh, because obviously we see more and more uh, evil people coming to power. And as we look at these things, too, it's so important for us that we remember, but we're part of a heavenly kingdom, and our God remains supreme over all the kingdoms of men. And, you know, when we read through the word, God brings up and he brings down the kingdoms of men. As much as they think it's themselves, as much as we think it's about men, you know, here was this this system being built. Here was this ruler setting up this kingdom, and God ended it in a day. Fascinating. When we get to Revelation, you know, Babylon is destroyed in an instant, in a day. It's destroyed very fast. And God changes things when he chooses and, you know, I think there's also important things for us to grab out of that within our nation and different things. We, we were raised up because God raised us up as a country. When will we cease to exist, exist as a country or fall as a country? Uh, when, when God says our time is up and not before then. And it's important that we remember that God remains sovereign over the affairs of men. And even in the midst of those different things, God is able to watch over his own, his church, and so it's important that our hope remains in Christ. And whether that is appointed to us, uh, uh, whatever may lay ahead of persecution or not, uh, our, ki- our citizenship is in heaven. Our reward, our eternity, where we are having our hope placed is not here. It's a heavenly. And we became citizens by the blood of Jesus Christ. And nobody can take it from us. And there will never come anything in that city that defiles it. It will always be perfect, and the ruler will always be perfect. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that. Verse 10, this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphax two years after the flood. After he begot Arphax, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Arphax lived 35 years and begot Selah. After he begot Selah, Arphax lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Selah lived 30 years and begot Eber. After he begot Eber, Selah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. After he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ru. After he begot Ru, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Ru lived 32 years and begot Sarig. And after he begot Sarig, Ru lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. Sarig lived 30 years and begot Nahor. After he begot Nahor, Sarig lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. And after he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot, and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. 
the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. This, of course, is the genealogy of the lineage of the seed of the woman promised for us in Genesis 3, the promised one, the, the Messiah. It also brings us to the development of the Jewish nation, beginning here with Abram, it becomes Abraham. We see that this is follows the uh, earlier account of, of chapter 5, where we're given the different names, but then in the lineage of the Messiah, we're also given the ages and the birth and the, and the descendants that it passed to and given much more detail, which again is, is thank you, Lord, because it allows us to have a better accuracy when we look at uh, how long ago were these things and what was the time frame between these different things. It helps us piece those all together. And again, it brings now from here, it really begins to dive into the development of the Jewish nation as we move forward, and we'll continue to follow through uh, with the promises of the Messiah who will come out of the Jewish nation. What are some things that we should take away from this passage? You know, one other note I'll make on that last passage, we also we see the, the lifespan begin to be greatly reduced. We see that through the different generations, that after the flood, something happened in the change. People were still living several hundred years, not as long as they were before now getting much shorter down into the hundreds and, and continues to decrease. But what are things we should take away from this passage? Well, one is thank you, Lord, that the fallen kingdoms of men will not dominate the world forever. That's one. God himself will rule over us and remove the evil from among us. So thank you, Lord. So when you look around and you see all the evil things going on in the world and you see all the bad things in politics going on in the world, we should be involved. We should, we should vote right. We should try to influence our country. We should preach and teach the truth. We should talk to our neighbors about truth. We should do those different things. But as we see uh, all the different evils among us, rejoice that you're part of a heavenly kingdom and our hope is not here. Number two, thank you, Lord, for intervening in history to bring redemption to us by becoming a man and dying in our place. Listen, we're only able to be a part of that heavenly kingdom because of the seed of the woman that's recorded for this lineage that's given here. If Christ did not come, we wouldn't be fit for the kingdom. We couldn't be made clean. Our sins are washed away. If those who are unrepentant in sin and unwashed were brought into heaven, then heaven would become sinful and death would remain. We have a way now to be made clean from our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, washed away, the sin nature removed, and the debt paid in full. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, not just that this evil won't exist outside, it won't exist inside. Number three, thank you, Lord, that the devil who is behind these things will one day be thrown into the lake of fire and no longer be able to lead men astray. We have an adversary in our lives now. He seems so powerful. And compared to us, apart from God, he is very powerful. But God will, God will cast him out. And he will have no power then. Number four, we should look forward to dwelling in his kingdom and in the new Jerusalem, where we will dwell with him forever. We will not be worshiping any false gods. We will be in the city of the king worshiping the true God. Amen? And so we should be thanking the Lord and looking forward to these things, keeping our hope in the right places. And we should learn from these things that we're careful of the systems of men, of the, of the ways that they try to come in and lead us into different worship of other gods. And we need to keep our guards up. And go, no, I'm going to dwell in the city of the king and I'm going to worship him forever. That's where we're going to be. Dear Lord, we come before you. We thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you, Father, for your heart towards mankind. I thank you, Lord, that when Adam sinned, you didn't just destroy us then. That you didn't just wipe us away. Lord, we see your mercy that through the flood you preserved Noah. Lord, as we see that shortly after, 
that already mankind begins to rebel, Lord, and to seek to, to worship these false gods, these demons. Lord, that you intervene and do not allow them to grab power over the world, that you scatter the people. And Lord, in one way, an act of judgment, Lord, but the other, an act of mercy. We thank you that you did that. Lord, as we see, too, the evil things increasing, Lord, the things that you've warned us about that would come. Lord, I thank you that our hope is in you. I thank you, Lord, that we, we seek a heavenly country. Lord, a place that you have prepared for those who love you. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, Father, I pray that they'd come to know you. That they'd place their faith in you, that they'd repent from their sins. But Lord, we thank you for the redemption, Lord, for those of us who have placed our faith in you, for those of us who belong to your citizenship, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we look forward to dwelling in your city and your kingdom forever. So Lord, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. From creation to the cross There from the cross into eternity Your grace finds me Yes, your grace